right now, the hot, hot, fiery hot topic right now is anti-diet culture. There's so many different diets. Doctors recommend the Mediterranean diet. I kind of like the carnivore diet. The keto diet is primarily a high fat, low carb diet. If I want a snack, I'm gonna have a snack. Everybody reacts differently to these foods. You know, the Western diet is very much based on processed foods and ultra processed foods. A lot of people don't realize that what they could do is something called the elimination diet. People will go all in on a diet, they go back in a couple of months. Confused? Yeah, me too. And that's why we're here to delve into the never ending and always confusing world of modern diets. The, the diet that worked for me was... the family dinner table, a sacred space where calories didn't count, and the only diet we knew was saying I'll pass to a second helping of Brussels sprouts. But times have changed, and so is the food on our plates. Yeah, if you interview a vegan, they're going to tell you all the things about it. If you eat a carnivore, you're going to hear the opposite. So it, like, then it starts to get confusing. And that's one of the reasons why our clients are so confused about what to eat, is because everyone's pointing fingers at everybody else saying it's wrong. I'm, I'm all for getting tacos if, if I want it. Really, it's, you can't really trust anybody. You have to really just do so much homework. How do we all have enough time, you know? To tell somebody, you gotta be a raw vegan, you gotta be keto, keto's the way. It's just, it's... Amidst this culinary chaos and multitude of choices, we find ourselves stumbling over a rather simple question. How do we even know what we're eating is healthy? What's the real? Habit change and the psychology around it is just as important as like the food itself in order for you to have long-term wellness. It's more about these conversations. So have these conversations with your neighbors, have these conversations with the people that you're out to dinner with. And the more we all talk about it, the more it comes to light. America. The standard American diet, where veggies play hide and seek and the burgers are stacked higher than the Sears Tower. The standard American diet is sort of a colloquialism <laughs> for having a diet that is filled with a lot of processed foods, high in sugar, high in fat, and also high in sodium. And really what that does is it affects our blood sugar. And when we eat highly refined carbohydrates, our blood sugar increases very dramatically. When the blood sugar is high, it weakens our metabolism. And then when the blood sugar crashes, that also weakens our metabolism. Everybody knows that the American diet is bad and they still eat it because it's delicious. It's easy, it's cheap. I don't think that the standard American diet should be the standard. Uh, I think again, it just all goes back to convenience. I miss the dollar menu at McDonald's and Taco Bell. It was cheap, it was easy, it was convenient. I used to just on my way home, go through the drive-thru, eat it out of my lap, and I've already eaten dinner before I've even gotten home. We're not biologically built to be able to process those things and extract nutrition from them. When we're looking at the standard American diet, it is the whole sum of all the things that you're putting into your body. And if the sum of what you're putting into your body is primarily a lot of those foods, that is not a recipe for having longevity because your body requires vitamins and minerals and cofactors and phytonutrients in order for it to actually function. That's really what's happening to our body from a standard American diet is these high levels of blood sugar, the blood sugar crashes and you're hungry again and then you go back for more carbohydrates that are then gonna increase your blood sugar again. So if you kind of look at biochemistry as sort of the cogs in a wheel and how if you picture the cogs and how they're all connected, the thing that makes that cog go 
is vitamins, nutrients, minerals, phytochemicals, phytonutrients, cofactors. When you're bringing standard American diet foods into your diet as a normal diet, then the nutrients needed aren't necessarily in those foods. We consider those foods what we call calorie dense and not necessarily nutrient dense. And so what starts to happen is when you're missing those things, the cogs can't spin. Because if, if you need this thing in the middle of A and B to make the first cog go and you don't have it, then your body's just gonna start dysfunctioning. The standard American diet also has a lot of fat. And when you eat carbohydrates and fat together, basically the carbohydrates are increasing a hormone called insulin, opening up our cells. And not only is it taking in the glucose, but it's taking in the fat with it. So combining carbohydrates and fat is, is really not a good idea. And that's what the basis of the standard American diet is. The standard American diet has become something that is just so bad because it consists of so much fat, so much sugar, so much processed foods that we're eating very little actual real food. And then you add in all of these additional chemicals and additional oils and sugars and all of these extra things. That being said, I don't know if there's any country that has a standard diet that should be followed. I mean, the French eat crepes and croissants every day. <laughs> Anytime you're seeing what we call our Western standard American diet showing up in other cultures where it previously didn't exist, you will start to see the chronic diseases and other things that we see here start to show up there. Well, the American standard diet doesn't sound so awesome. What are the alternatives? The Mediterranean style diet is something that has been so widely studied. The Mediterranean diet hails from the sunny shores of countries like Greece, Italy, and Spain, where life is meant to be savored. Primarily they're getting their, the bulk of their nutrients from carbs, believe it or not. But they're whole grains, right? So bread, cereal, even pasta, things that we would scoff at in the United States, but they are not processed, they are not packaged. They are whole grains that are coming from the whole wheat, including gluten, by the way, which is something that we vilify in the United States. The Mediterranean diet is pretty cool. It's something that is a base that I wish was more in the American diet across the board. It uses a lot of different oils and raw vegetables that we don't really get a lot of because again, they fall into the good fats and things like that because not all fats are created equal, not all protein is created equal, and certainly not all carbs. A huge uh, source of protein for them are plant-based proteins like beans, legumes. Uh, they do incorporate some dairy, some poultry, fish is a primary source of protein. They reserve sweets, alcohol, and red meat to maybe a couple times a month. So whereas we tend to get a lot of our calories, they really limit that. Uh, so primarily good carbs, fruits and vegetables, legumes, uh, and I forgot to mention good fats. So avocados, olives, uh, nuts, seeds, and the oils that come from those foods. Mediterranean diets are probably the most popular diets, particularly when it comes to conventional medicine as well and doctors and what they're recommending, is because it is probably the most studied diet with the most research with the longest history. Doctors recommend the Mediterranean diet because it's really an unprocessed diet. The basis is olive oil, so they, there you have an unprocessed seed oil. It's fresh fish, it's fresh vegetables. Everything is really fresh from the Mediterranean diet, and it is a very healthy anti-inflammatory diet. Inflammation is really a bunch of biochemical, everything is biochemical. That's the funny thing about nutrition, right? Is we don't, we think about nutrition as food, and it is, it comes from food, but we don't think about the fact that nutrition is actually our body's interaction with chemicals. And so it, it's how our biochemistry sort of functions. When you're inundating your body with too much of something that can be what we call inflammatory, it sets off these biochemical reactions because your body reacts to it and it goes, oh, I don't like what that's doing. And so the, there are these inflammatory cascades as a defense mechanism that your body starts to kind of just release that causes what we know is inflammation. The, the root of most chronic diseases, not only is inflammation, but it's something called insulin resistance. And that is when your body cannot use carbohydrates 
any longer for energy. So when your body can't use carbohydrates for energy, they begin to store as what we call visceral fat in, in your liver, in your pancreas, around your organs, and that is the really bad fat. That is the fat that creates inflammation itself, and that is the fat that really wreaks havoc on your health, on your metabolic health. We have hundreds of thousands of studies on the Mediterranean diet spanning over many years that have demonstrated benefits to multiple different systems has been shown to to benefit the cardiac system so the mediterranean diet has been shown to help in primary prevention which means helping prevent people from going on to developing heart disease or heart attacks de novo it's also been shown to be helpful in secondary prevention so going on to develop a recurrent heart attack once you've already had one. And we know that there's medications like aspirin and statin that can prevent heart attacks. We know through very rigorous medical studies that the Mediterranean diet can reduce the risk of heart attack, uh, stroke, even cardiac mortality when uh, chosen over a Western style diet. The reason why the Mediterranean diet is viewed as so healthy is because it, the idea of it, if you're following it properly, it eliminates so much of that questionable stuff. It's a low sugar diet. It doesn't include red or processed meats in the same way. And it doesn't include processed foods in the same way. You're talking whole grains, fruits and vegetables, olives, olive oil, fish, lean meats. So you're getting those healthy omega-3 fats that are gonna lower inflammation. You're gonna lower your inflammation in general because you're focusing on whole foods. Again, balance. There's no kind of one and done recommendation here. We have to also keep in mind all those other things that they're doing, right? More plants, more plant-based proteins, more movement, that they're getting more movement. And some of the Mediterranean style pyramid, the pyramid actually has a little guy jogging or gal jogging on the side. So that's considered a nutrient exercise that is. You know, unlike other diets, I really don't feel like there's anything super negative about the Mediterranean diet. I mean, people could take the whole grain thing and end up eating processed foods um, in that category, or they can eat too much of them, you know, in relation to other fruits and vegetables and things like that and still call it Mediterranean because technically that's part of the diet. Just like, you know, vegans can become carbitarians. But if you're following that particular diet the way you're supposed to, there isn't really anything super negative about it. I just think that people want to eat cookies too sometimes. While the Mediterranean diet is celebrated for its many health benefits, including reduced risk of heart disease and longevity, it's not without potential downsides. Its emphasis on olive oil and nuts, while healthy in moderation, can lead to excessive calorie intake if not managed properly, potentially causing weight gain. Additionally, some individuals may struggle with the diet's heavy reliance on whole grains, which could affect blood sugar levels. And despite its healthful components, portion control is key to prevent overconsumption. If you have insulin issues or carbohydrate issues, that is not gonna help you get to your goals because it still has pastas and grains and those are still part of the Mediterranean diet. So if weight loss is a goal, the Mediterranean diet really isn't going to help. I'm just not sure that the Mediterranean diet feels realistic to the vast population because people like burgers and french fries and we live in a world that contains cookies and cake and donuts and whatever else people <laughs> like to eat. The ketogenic diet, or keto for short, is a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet designed to push your body into a state of ketosis, where your body shifts from using carbohydrates as its primary energy source to burning fat for fuel. The ketogenic diet, I don't really consider it a diet. I really think of it as a metabolic process, and you're fixing this broken metabolism that most people in this world have. By severely limiting carbs and increasing your fat intake, the keto diet aims to promote weight loss and in some cases improve certain health markers like blood sugar levels. The hallmark of the ketogenic diet is high fat, low carb. So it's not high fat by itself, but the low carb thing is really key. What are you supposed to eat then? 
Some key foods include fatty cuts of meat, poultry, fish, eggs, butter, oils like olive and coconut oil, avocados, and full fat dairy products. Non-starchy vegetables such as leafy greens, broccoli, and cauliflower are also permitted in moderation. Nuts, seeds, and low-carb fruits like berries are suitable for snacking. Keto is a low-carbohydrate, high-fat eating regimen. Yes, it is. It's a diet where butter and bacon are on the menu, but bread and pasta take a back seat. If weight loss is a goal and your body is, knows how to use fat for energy, you wouldn't want to be eating all the fat. You actually need to share the fat with your own fat stores. So for someone in a weight loss situation, they get to eat a little bit of fat, but they want most of the fat coming from their own storage fat. Many people mistakenly view the keto diet as an all-you-can-eat fat fest. While it does emphasize healthy fats, it's not a carte blanche to devour unlimited amounts of butter and bacon. Instead, the diet focuses on a balanced intake of fats, moderate protein, and minimal carbs, making it more nuanced than simply indulging all the fatty foods you desire. It's a really big misconception in the keto world is that you just, you can't eat, it's not an all you can eat fat diet. That's a really, really big misconception. For someone who's in maintenance, like me, I get to eat really, the, I get to balance my fat. But when I consult my clients and, and weight loss is important, I, gotta, I, I let them have fat in the beginning and then I slowly, slowly lower the fat. So that's maybe where some of those products come into play. But most foods labeled as ketogenic will have significant amounts of fat in them. It's true that if you eliminate a huge category of food, namely carbohydrates, that you're going to lose weight, right? Particularly when our society gets the bulk of our calories from carbohydrates. By some estimates, 80% of the American diet comes from carbohydrates. And we're not talking about asparagus, right? We're talking about Pop-Tarts. So if you eliminate that huge category of primarily processed foods, of course you're gonna achieve weight loss. And when you achieve weight loss, you see benefits to health. Blood sugar goes down, uh, cholesterol goes down, blood pressure goes down, we sleep better, ovulation is enhanced. I mean, there are so many benefits. Keto's meteoric rise in popularity can be attributed to its promises of quick weight loss and the allure of the indulgent high-fat foods. With endorsements from celebrities and influencers alike, it's captured the public's imagination as a trendy and effective way to shed pounds. You're starting to see it with more and more because it kind of came back. But it really, it was studied for brain issues, you know, for epilepsy. And then now it's being studied more in people with cognitive decline and things like dementia and Alzheimer's and stuff like that. So brain related. It didn't have a lot of popularity. It was used for that one little population. And then, you know, it sort of made a comeback. People realized, oh, it puts you into this like starvation mode. And then you shed all this weight. So people like that because anything that helps people lose weight fast, oh my gosh, that's the best thing in the world. Yeah, I lose weight super fast. My friend lost X amount of weight, you know, and I have to do that too. But it became this fad diet that everybody decided was a good idea. With the keto of it not being something that people could just go, it's not an easy life. You have to be completely committed to it. You have to be able to cook. A lot of people think the ketogenic diet is not sustainable for long term because they think that it's too strict. But really, keto needs to be thought of as a lifestyle and not just a diet. There can be benefits in terms of blood sugar regulation. So you have somebody who might be pre-diabetic and they're trying to get their blood sugar under control and so they go on something like the keto diet. I've heard some anecdotal things about people with autoimmune diseases getting things under control and things like that. Mostly people turn to it for weight loss. A lot of people come to me for weight loss, but in my process of educating them, I really share all the research of ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet really started with trying to reduce epilepsy in children because they found that 
children in ketosis had less seizure activity than people who, than, than kids that were eating carbohydrates. But since then, the research has grown exponentially in terms of gut diseases or gout or these insulin resistance diseases, cancer, PCOS, neurological conditions. The, the, the wave of the future for the ketogenic diet is in neurological and psychiatric diseases. You might be wondering though, how does keto work? So once you lower your carbohydrate intake to a low enough level, your body will start to understand that it no longer can use carbohydrates for energy. What you're trying to do is you're trying to trick your body from having this glucose spike because that's the thing that's going to keep you in ketosis. The process of entering ketosis takes about four to seven days. It's a little bit of a slow process. Uh, once you start taking the carbohydrate away, your body will use up all the carbohydrates that, that's in storage in your body. Once that is gone, your body says, okay, I have no, where am I gonna get my energy from? There are only two sources of energy that your body can use. Glucose from carbohydrates and fat and ketones, either from eating fat or from your own fat. Some people start to feel that they're going into ketosis. If you're not eating the right things and you're not sometimes supplementing with electrolytes, you'll feel something called the keto flu. The keto flu is a temporary set of symptoms, including fatigue, headache, and nausea that some people experience when their bodies are adapting to the ketogenic diet. It's like your body's way of saying, wait, where are my carbs? As it shifts into fat burning mode, thankfully, it's usually short-lived and a sign you're on the path to ketosis. So you'll know because your body is shifting its source of energy. For most people, the last time they were in ketosis was at birth. We are born in ketosis at birth. So if you've never fasted and if you've never lowered your carbohydrate intake to a low enough amount, your body has never been in ketosis. Keto can offer several potential benefits. First and foremost, it can aid in weight loss by encouraging the body to burn stored fat for energy. This can lead to reduced body fat and improved body composition. Additionally, ketosis may help stabilize blood sugar levels, making it a valuable option for people with type 2 diabetes or those looking to manage their insulin sensitivity. Some individuals also report increased mental clarity and sustained energy levels while in ketosis, which can be advantageous for focus and productivity. Well, I'm a ketogenic nutritionist and I promote keto for people who I feel are gonna benefit from the diet. I don't say that everybody should be on a ketogenic diet. It really depends on um, what their he current health is, maybe what their family history of disease is, and what their goals are. At the time of this filming, there is not a lot of long-term research. And I think people think that there is a lot of long-term research when it comes to general health and weight loss, but the historical research on ketogenic diets was epilepsy for children. And now there are more short-term studies that show benefit for a lot of people, but there aren't a lot of long-term studies. And so we're starting to see some of the long-term studies come out and we're not necessarily seeing 100% great results. So typically when you're doing something really dramatic like that, it's something that we like to only do short-term so that we can get the benefit and then start bringing other things back if that's the route we take at all because it may not be the best fit for that person. There have been people where I've said, you know, I don't think keto is for you. Some people who have a hard time processing fat obviously cannot be on a ketogenic diet, but really for a person who is looking for an anti-inflammatory, anti-aging eating regimen, keto is really where it's at. The carnivore diet is a highly restrictive eating plan that exclusively focuses on animal-based foods. It involves the consumption of meat, fish, and animal-derived products like eggs and dairy, while completely excluding plant-based foods, including fruits, vegetables, grains, and legumes. Advocates of the carnivore diet 
argue that it can simplify nutrition and potentially offer health benefits. But its extreme nature raises concerns about the potential nutritional deficiencies and the lack of long-term research on its safety and effectiveness. I push back a little bit against carnivore diets because I think it also speaks to kind of the way we used to live. I think that's the confusion now with what healthy eating is in America. You know, what do I eat to be healthy? I'm trying to avoid fat so that I'm eating carbohydrates. But wait, carbohydrates aren't good for me because they're highly processed. So there is a lot of confusion. And as I always say, getting back and trying to eat like our ancestors did and how our genes were really developed to be fed is the best suggestion on really what healthy eating is all about. When we talk about the way we used to live or what was good for our ancestors, we can't cherry pick. We can't cherry pick their dietary patterns and leave the fact that they spent the bulk of their day moving their bodies and in physical activity. So what they may have achieved in terms of benefits of eating that in that way, in large part has come from also the other nutrients that they got being movement or exercise, even sleep, being more aligned with the rising of the sun and the falling of the sun. What did that do to their hypothalamus and regulation of their other body system? We have to look at the whole picture and not just isolate the parts that we would like to isolate. There's not a lot of research on the carnivore diet, not like we would want, I suppose, but there's people will talk about lowering blood sugar getting their blood sugar under control, reducing their autoimmune disease because perhaps they're having reactions to plant foods. and But it's not a diet that you can do forever by any means. People cannot live on just a carnivore diet because you cannot get all of the nutrients that you need from just eating meat. I kind of like the carnivore diet. Anytime you could avoid the processed foods, avoid the packaged foods, things that could sit on a shelf in a grocery store for six months and never go bad, that's got to tell you something. What is it doing to the inside of your body? Is your body actually breaking it down? The studies have shown that red meat itself, as well as pro processed or packaged red meats, are associated with higher risk of heart attacks, higher risk of stroke, higher risk of heart disease, the debate over the health impact of red meat is ongoing. Advocates argue that it's a valuable source of nutrients like protein and iron, while critics point to potential health risks associated with excessive consumption, particularly processed red meats. Scientific research continues to explore the complex relationship between red meat consumption and various health outcomes, leaving the question of its overall healthiness a subject of ongoing discussion. The dietary patterns that are associated with better health, like Mediterranean style diet, tends to eliminate or at least limit significantly the amount of red meat. We also know that red meat is associated with colon cancer. There's been studies that have linked it to uh, cognitive decline, dementia, maybe even Alzheimer's disease. We don't have any conclusive evidence whether eating meat is gonna increase your risk of cancer or any other chronic disease. There is an association with certain types of meats, red meats, processed meats like sausages and you know, salted meat, stuff like that, that's been stored, uh, and colon cancer. There's, there's an association there. We know that based on the scientific evidence that we have right now in terms of correlation. It can be correlated that the people who are eating these types of foods, we're often seeing those people get colon cancer. So it's not a smoking gun per se, but, but the correlation has been seen consistently. That myth about eating meat will give you cancer is debunked. There's research studies out there showing, you know, half of them show an increased risk of some kind of condition eating meat and the other half don't show any risk. Many health experts and studies suggest that it's processed meats that may be the real villain when it comes to bad health, rather than natural meats. Processed meats often contain additives, high levels of sodium and preservatives, which are associated with increased risks of conditions like heart disease and cancer. In contrast, 
lean unprocessed meats provide essential nutrients and can be part of a balanced diet when consumed in moderation. It's probable that that is the case, that it is primarily processed meats and, and red meat also is part of that association. Uh, things like chicken and turkey, those kinds of meats really don't have that same correlation unless they are also processed meats like sausages and things like that. Having some kind of clean, lean meats, like fish, chicken, those things, the association isn't as high with those types of meats. According to a poll, the number of vegans in Britain quadrupled between 2014 and 2016. Vegetarianism and veganism are dietary lifestyles characterized by different levels of abstaining from animal products. Vegetarians typically exclude meat, but may still consume some dairy products and eggs. On the other hand, vegans avoid all animal-derived foods, including meat, dairy, eggs, and even honey. People choose these lifestyles for various reasons. Some choose to be vegetarians or vegans due to ethical concerns, aiming to reduce animal suffering and promote animal welfare. And the good news for vegans is that there are some known health benefits. Health considerations can also play a role, with individuals adopting these diets to reduce the risk of certain diseases or promote overall well-being. Vegetarians are primarily people who decide that they do not want to consume animal meat. Uh, they will consume eggs. Vegetarians will consume cheese and things that come from animals, but they will not eat chicken or beef or pork or anything like that. A pescatarian is a vegetarian who will eat eggs and cheese, but they'll also eat fish. So there's, there's sort of a spectrum even, even there, but they won't eat chicken or, or red meat. Vegans won't eat any animal products or anything that comes from an animal at all. Some people go down the route of being vegan or vegetarian because they might have sort of moral implications about consuming animals and animal wel welfare and things like that. And then some of it is the assumption that it's a healthier diet. And being vegan or vegetarian does not equal health. Plant-based does not mean devoid of processed foods. In fact, what tends to happen is that when people become vegetarian, they run out of sources of food, primarily sources of protein, and so then they seek that in a processed or packaged way. So I do think it's kind of a misnomer for people to think that just because they're vegetarian, they're necessarily healthy. Um, my own children decided to go vegetarian for a period of time and what I told them is what I tell my patients. If you're going to go vegetarian, you have to be a responsible vegetarian, which means really going through the time and the effort that it requires to get a wholesome nutritional source of nutrients, including protein. So I, I don't want to confuse vegetarianism necessarily with a healthy style of eating, particularly for that very reason that people tend to go towards more processed foods. For some reason, people assume that the vegetarian diet is automatically healthy and that you're gonna lose weight. But the problem is, is that not all vegetarian is the same. You, a lot of people who turn to the vegetarian diet actually really overeat on carbs. They end up gaining weight because their body's not used to that. So the vegetarian movement and all these kind of vegetarian meats are loaded and loaded with these highly processed seed oils, which are very detrimental to our health. An example would be the Impossible Burger. It has more highly processed seed oils than any meat that you could ever eat. So it is a concern with the vegetarian diet. I, I see a lack of important amounts of protein and protein sources in a, in a vegetarian or vegan diet but also the fact that it's, it could lead to enormous amounts of inflammation. And, and it's very obvious for me to identify someone who eats a vegan or vegetarian diet because you're missing out on a lot of the important nutrients that are contained in animal products. I have a lot of clients who were previously vegan who had low immune function, uh, iron deficiency, you know, their calcium levels weren't where they needed to be. You know, you can get minerals and vitamins and things you need from those diets, but 
usually it requires supplementing to some degree. Minerals and, and protein that come from animal products are more bioavailable. Our body can take them up quicker and more efficiently and better than we can plant-based foods that have the same thing. So for instance, if you're consuming a plant-based food that has iron in it, you need to consume it with vitamin C because that improves the uptake of it. So being a vegan or a vegetarian for some people can become a really big job because you really have to understand the interactions between nutrients and what a complete protein is and how to get that because not all plant foods, most plant foods are not complete proteins and that matters because we need complete proteins are all the essential amino acids because our body can't make them. Meat contains all the essential amino acids. There's a couple of plant foods that do as well, but other than that, they have to pair. A steak has this much grams of protein and broccoli has this much, but you would have to eat like 40 pounds of broccoli to get the same amount of protein that the other one has. And what will actually wreak havoc on your body to eat that much broccoli to even come close to the protein intake of what a steak has, that it like doesn't even make sense. I mean, there are two major dangers. You put them in the two categories. One category is you don't get the, the vital minerals and nutrients and protein that you need. And what can happen is in order to get, you know, the calories and the blood sugar regulation and things like that to balance their blood sugar, you know, they'll, they might crave carbs or they might eat. Sometimes people jokingly will call some vegetarians carbitarians because there are so many vegetarians who will eat a lot of processed breads and crackers and foods and stuff like that. That's not everybody, you know, but that's a, that's a version of it. There's plenty of vegans and vegetarians out there who eat tons of plant-based foods. They hire vegan nutritionists and, and so they really learn how to take care of their bodies the right way. The thing about saying plant-based food and that it's just all of a sudden healthy for some reason is kind of a misconception because there's a lot of unhealthy plants out there. And one of the things that they use a lot of is sugar. Sugar is a plant, it grows in the ground. So they add sugar to so many different things. And there's all sorts of these other things that get added to um, this manufactured food. And whenever you put that much processing into the foods, so much of the health and nutrients actually come out of it. In fact, there was a lot of study done on um, if vegans were more likely to break bones than non-vegans. And the, the results were just that. Vegans were more likely to break bones than non-vegans. I don't know if that's part of the standard American version of, of a vegan diet, because if you look at other countries, um, like in Africa, they'll have people with really, really strong bones who don't eat as, as much of the traditional milk calcium and things that we think of but they still have really strong bones. To me, it breaks down to not all proteins are created equal. Protein is our most satiating macronutrient. So when you talk about our three macronutrients, you have uh, protein, you have carbohydrates, you have fat, protein is the most satiating. And when you eliminate protein from the diet, you're removing a source of nutrition that is going to help keep you full. What are we gonna do in place of that? If we're gonna fill that void with more carbohydrates, if we're gonna fill it with more packaged or processed carbohydrates, which is where Americans tend to get the bulk of their diet from anyway, then we really aren't getting any additional health value from going plant-based or vegetarian. We can have reactions to plants in the negative, in that we can become sensitive to things. And sometimes that comes with a breakdown of the gut microbiome actually. Plant toxins are defense chemicals that plants create so we don't eat them, like whoever doesn't eat them. Plants naturally produce various compounds, which can have adverse effects if consumed excessively. These compounds may interfere with nutrient absorption or cause digestive discomfort in some people. However, it's important to note that many of these compounds are generally harmless when consumed in moderation and can even offer health benefits. Proper cooking, soaking, or processing of certain plant-based foods can also mitigate their potential negative effects. It's also the fact that all of our food in this country is poisonous. But eat, you know, as raw as possible natural foods and organic, grass-fed, grass-finished, like you have to go through these steps. I think it's all about balance. 
It's true that organ meats, for example, are a great source of nutrition. They're replete with lots of vitamins and minerals. There are some categories of people that may benefit from that. So people who have failure to thrive, significant anemias are not getting that kind of nutrition from other sources. The other category that we worry about is that a lot of the sort of uh, vegan or vegetarian versions like our plant-based meats. Is the burger extinct? Plant-based meats have gained a lot of popularity in recent years as an alternative to traditional animal-based meat products. Advancements in food technology have enabled the development of plant-based meat substitutes that closely mimic the taste and texture of red meat. Those kinds of things are, can be really highly processed foods. And we think, oh, it's plant-based, so it must be healthy, when in fact, you're, you're trading one thing for another. You know, you're trading what you view as unhealthy red meat for a plant-based something else that is completely a processed food. And it could be high in sodium and, and other things that can be damaging to our health too. Additionally, some plant-based meats are very high in saturated fats, which can be detrimental to one's health if consumed in excess. When we looked at the ingredients on these products, it was like the impossible stuff. I mean, that's a whole list of things that can't pronounce half of them. And there's two or three different types of seed oils in there. That's the question. It's like, is a plant-based Impossible Burger, or, you know, insert brand name here, really better than like a lean beef burger or a turkey burger or something like that? It's almost impossible, be honest, as a, as a consumer to find a vegan product that doesn't have something that also compromises your health unless it's organic fruits and veggies. So we were talking about plant-based. Plant-based or primary plants uh, in the diet is a very nutritious way of eating. We know that we were talking about obesity earlier, so uh, fruits and vegetables tend to be a high source of vitamins, minerals, nutrients without the calorie load. So a high nutritional val value without the calorie density. I always like to share that my favorite vegetable that I eat on the daily is arugula. Arugula has about five calories per cup, but it has 30 vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and antioxidants. So you get a lot of value without the calorie load. So there's lots of benefits of going plant, primarily plant. I tried vegan and because I got, I got too heavy after I tore my hip. I got too big and the vegan thing, I ended up hurting myself. It wasn't good. And I, was, I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't happy eating. You know, a couple months in, I, I would eat vegan food all day, and then I would have like a big steak before I went to bed. Just as I had to have the meat. Vegetarians and vegans often face social stigmas in society. Some people stereotype them as overly restrictive or judgmental, which can lead to social awkwardness or even exclusion from certain social gatherings. These dietary choices are sometimes seen as unconventional, leading to misunderstandings or even teasing. I think that what your values are and your philosophy is when it comes to food welfare and things like that, I think it can cause social discord. Because if you feel very strongly about something and your other friend feels the opposite way, you know, you might think that they don't share the same values that you do and therefore maybe they're not a good person to hang out with. So you might, you might change your friendships. It might be, oh, your friends are getting together and they're going to a barbecue joint and you're a vegan, so you don't eat barbecue and so you don't go. And so then you don't, you aren't getting that social connection that you normally would have gotten. So there definitely can be social implications of being in a very specific diet, but you know, that's up to the individual person and their, their philosophy. And I mean, I know many vegan people who will just go and just hang out and have something to drink and they'll eat separately. Or, you know, they don't have any qualms about their meat eating friends because it's a personal choice and they understand that. They don't judge other people.
A lot of people don't realize that what they could do is something called the elimination diet. The elimination diet is a systematic approach to pinpoint and manage food sensitivities and allergies by temporarily removing specific foods or food groups from one's diet and then gradually reintroducing them. By doing so, individuals can identify and alleviate adverse reactions, such as digestive issues or skin problems, helping them better understand their dietary triggers and make informed choices about what to eat for improved health and well-being. Everybody's a little different. There's some people that are walk around that are lactose intolerant that never even knew that they are. So the elimination diet will be going up to a month just completely cutting dairy out. And for most people, they will notice that their skin will clear up and they'll look better. Their stomach issues may go down, maybe bloating, maybe those couple extra pounds that your body's been holding on to. And one of the benefits with with eliminating something like dairy is that there's plenty of other options out there. There's so many good dairy options, non-dairy options out there with all the vegan cheeses and the milks and all that type of thing that a lot of people just don't even realize that that's what it is. So for somebody to either go full, full keto, they might not even, their, their body might not even be able to process something that the keto diet has. So I recommend the elimination diet and actually stick to it. If you want to see how your body works without gluten, completely cut out gluten for a week or a month and then really see how you feel. If your skin clears up, your stomach feels better, then you probably have a gluten intolerance. I recommend that everybody take the food intolerance test because there might be something that you eat basically every single day that your body literally can't handle. And you just don't realize how good you could feel until you cut out flour or something. I mean, everybody's got something that their body just does not do well with. Fasting diets, also known as intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, are dietary patterns that involve alternating between periods of eating and fasting. These diets don't necessarily prescribe specific foods, but rather dictate when you can consume them. Common fasting approaches like the 16-8 method, where one fasts for 16 hours and eats during an 8-hour window, or the 5-2 diet, which involves eating normally for five days a week and significantly reducing calorie intake, often to around five or 600 calories on the remaining two days. Fasting diets have gained popularity for their potential benefits, including weight management, improved metabolism, and better blood sugar control. Fasting is an interesting one that people have been going through a lot lately. I know there's the intermittent fasting and it's like everybody has the thing. It's like, oh, what do you do? Are you a 16, eight person or, uh, or you know, I'm a more of a 17, seven. People have had great results on it. You know, a lot of times people do overeat whenever they eat all day long, where we actually see the calories that they're supposed to get. So whenever you eliminate and you put it into that window, it's almost like skipping, skipping breakfast. Now you get a, you know, a lunch, a snack and a dinner. And, and if that's what it takes to get into it, then I'm all for it. I absolutely love intermittent fasting. I think it makes sense. It's kind of the closest thing we can get to being primal again. I read a lot of research on fasting and there's, there's definitely different avenues to fasting. There's some people that don't like it so much and they're like, well, but I don't know. I just know what worked for me. I knew that historically I'd wake up, I'm never hungry. I'm always hungry late at night. But I just said, well, I'm going to go with it. So I wake up and I kind of, I don't want to say I cheat, but I don't do a strict fast. I literally have a large cup of iced coffee with heavy cream. Why? Because it's that fat that's going to get the fat burning, but no sugar. And I literally will sip on that till two, sometimes till five. And then my eating windows between five and 10, and then I'll have two decent meals. If I suggest an intermittent fasting type of nutrition plan to somebody, what I try to explain is after sleeping, the body is, well, during sleep, obviously we're fasting. We're using our fats to, you know, repair the brain, so on and so forth. Now, when we wake up, we have to think of our bodies as a sponge. It's empty and that sponge-like material it has nothing in it. So what we eat first is so important. It really sets the precedence 
for you know how the rest of our day is gonna go. I tell people maybe just try to scoot their breakfast a little bit later, a little bit later, and try to have something that's like pre-digested or you know a shake. So that way we know at the beginning of our day that we're absorbing the maximum amount of nutrients that we possibly can. Then noting certain things uh, like it takes two hours to digest and an hour to rest for the gut. So if that's the case, I don't want to continuously snack. I want to have good fulfilling meals every three or four hours that are proportionate, that have a little bit of all those minerals, vitamins, and fats. And when you do this for a little while, it becomes like second nature you can listen to your body again. It's not sending you mixed signals. The biggest thing I had to learn was, you're full, dude. You don't need to eat anymore. That's the key. And now my, I've got it where if I, if I overeat, it just doesn't feel good. It's just not worth it. So it's a conditioned response. Once you start seeing the benefits of getting thinner, I mean, you guys realize my waist, now what, 48? My waist was a 48. I think my jacket size was like 62. Right now, my waist is 34. That's crazy, 34 at 55 years old. I think it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. There have been studies that have shown that there's benefits to fasting in terms of longevity, in terms of metabolic health. In terms of weight loss, the studies are a lot more uh, conflicting. And again, what, what appears to happen is that there isn't durability there, there isn't longevity. And so while people will achieve weight loss in the short term, they won't necessarily achieve weight loss in the long term. Intermittent fasting can be a good thing. I know that it, it could do a little bit of damage to the body where people are like, oh, I just drink five cups of coffee to get me through the morning because I have no energy because I have no food in my system. It's like, don't know how I feel about that because, you know, it's a lot of coffee to intake. It's really going to turn your stomach. I find something else, though, just anecdotally, this is my own experience with my own patients, is that when they fast, they tend to be hungrier later. So as opposed to just eating one or two hard boiled eggs at 70 calories each, they skip that, right? But then they compensate, they far overcompensate because now they are behind the eight ball of their hunger. The hunger has amassed to a degree that it's very hard for them to be satiated. And actually the science shows this as well, that when people fast, hunger hormones go up, appetite goes up, and people do become insatiable. So they tend to overcompensate. Another thing that I think happens is that people typically will skip breakfast and then backload their calories. And now studies are showing that that whole phrase that, um, well, nobody said it in my house because my parents were from Iran, but eat breakfast like a king, dinner like a pauper, right? Like there's actually science behind that because when you save uh, or utilize your nutrients in the first part of the day, you metabolize that food in a different way that supports metabolic health as well as healthier weight, as opposed to when you don't eat in the morning and save your calories for later in the day, you actually become better able at storing that fat, storing those calories. So we may be gaining more weight for the same amount of calories when we skip breakfast and eat larger dinners. Okay, okay, I get it. But which is the best diet? I think when it comes to any diet, any diet, whether it's vegan, vegetarian, whatever, if you're looking at it from a restrictive standpoint, like I have to take foods out in order to be healthy or automatically assuming that those diets are healthy just because a book said that they were or the, you know, the news said that it was. Occasional inflammation might mean something is off with your body, but chronic inflammation may mean your diet is really grinding your body's gears. And that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about personalized nutrition is because so much of it comes down to yourself. How does your body, which is not like any other body, react to certain foods? How are your biochemical processes working? How is your liver health? Do you have genetic things that mean that you can't process certain things? One person can have five cups of coffee and not have any bad reactions to that. And you give another person half a cup of coffee 
and it ruins their entire day because they can't tolerate the caffeine. Every single person is different. So whether a vegan or a vegetarian diet or paleo or Mediterranean, however it's going to look, if we're, if we're going to do something that we have to label, you know, it's going to depend on your body and what's good for you and what is it. While I have my feelings about one diet versus another, I tend to not like fad diets in general. I also don't vilify diets. If somebody wants to do intermittent fasting or even the keto diet for the short term to jumpstart themselves and get the ball moving, I absolutely say go for it. But I have learned in the almost 20 years of doing this work that there is this other component that is much deeper and that is much more important to address without which we cannot sustain this effort. And that is really tuning into what our hunger is signaling. There are so many reasons why we use food. Yes, we use it for hunger. We also use it to soothe. And food is a very important or a very easy way to get that dopamine hit, that feeling of reward that we can also get, by the way, through human connection, sunshine, movement, so many other ways of getting that feel good uh, release of dopamine. But food is easy, it's accessible, it's reliable. And so we become conditioned to turn to food when really we may be seeking or needing something else. Oftentimes when people are turning to specific diets with a name, you know, they are turning from a standard American diet and moving into all of a sudden they're paying more attention to what they're eating. And so the act of paying more attention to what you're eating and bringing in certain cleaner foods or whole foods, whether that's meat or vegetables, you know, or grains of some kind that are whole grain, you know, all of a sudden they feel better and they go, oh my gosh, the ketogenic diet worked for me. Or, you know, whatever diet, insert name here, worked for me. Then it's like, well, yeah, because you're taking in whole foods, which you weren't doing as much before. It's amazing what can happen when you take in whole foods. Yeah, hunger pains are tough, especially whenever you work out as much as I do, you're gonna get hungry and sometimes your food just isn't enough and you gotta up it. And, and it gets really tough because I was a grazer for a very long time. I could go to my refrigerator nine times a night and each time I'm gonna grab five grapes this time. And oh, maybe do I do I dare grab a, grab a Girl Scout cookie that's there? If I just eat one, I'm okay. And we could all justify those types of decisions. And cravings are also complicated too, right? So they, they are determined by a lot of things like what you're doing, what you're not doing. Cravings very much are dependent on our habitual actions. So if we got into a, the habit of picking up a glass of wine every afternoon during the lockdown of the pandemic, or if we got into the habit of having something sweet after dinner, your body is on autopilot. It's very much like how we drive to work every day. By the third month of driving to your workplace, you're not really thinking about take a left at you know this street and take a right at the other. You are in an automated fashion arriving at your workplace. The very same thing happens when you start to do habitual activities with food. It becomes automated. And when you don't respond to that automation, when you don't respond, uh, then you get uncomfortable. That craving will increase in intensity. One of the things I recommend to my patients is looking at the craving like a wave. A craving or our desire has kind of a physiology or morphology very much like a wave. There's kind of this crescendo, right? Like the craving starts out and then it escalates and it escalates and it escalates. And we usually get to this point where we feel like our head is going to explode if we don't respond to that craving. And we usually respond. But what if we just held on tight and breathed into that craving and allowed the discomfort, right? Don't fight the discomfort, but acknowledge, I really want that cookie or that glass of wine. And it's making me feel like my head is going to blow off if I don't get it. What happens then? we may notice that you get a decrescendo of that craving. That craving will not last forever and ever and for as long as you shall live. 
I was a researcher for many years at a university and I started my own clinical practice in 2018. And as soon as I started consulting on low carb, keto happened to be one of them. The more I learned about a ketogenic diet, the more I wanted to shout out to the rest of the world that this is going to be the healthiest way that you can eat. So I myself tried it, started in 2000, probably 18, and I have never looked back. And I now actually only do consulting for the ketogenic diet. So I am an internist. I'm an MD, uh, internal medicine board certified. I also specialize in obesity medicine and as a physician nutrition specialist. What I actually am is a certified nutrition specialist or a CNS, and we're a little bit unknown. Most people are familiar with registered dietitians, and registered dietitians are great, and they, they know a lot, and uh, they're kind of the OG as far as teaching people about nutrition. I am a fitness enthusiast. I was a really fat kid growing up, and then I broke my leg whenever I was in high school, and had to, had to get multiple surgeries, and I swole up to about 230 pounds, and I just thought that that's how it was then. I still ate whatever I wanted and I was still lifting weights. I've been a weightlifting enthusiast since I was about 13 years old. I always wanted to be like the big 80s action stars or American gladiators. And whenever all the weight just fell onto me, because it happens really fast, I come from a bigger family and I just blew up and I knew that that's not what I wanted to be. I ended up joining the Marine Corps at 19, and now it was the three square meals every day, activity every single day. I got stronger, I got more confident. It's a look good, feel good type of scenario. Being raised in an Italian household, food is love. And so I was raised with a lot of love my whole life. And I definitely had a wonderful appreciation for food. My wife and I are really conscious about, you know, what we put in our bodies we decided to open a restaurant because in America at least, we're getting so far away from healthy food. We care about our customers, we, you know, we care that they don't have to go to the doctor because, you know, they're, they're having gut issues. You know, we find that very important. I want to be able to change somebody's life because life is good. I grew up very poor and I missed a lot of nutrients and I actually developed a form of epilepsy later in life and was on a lot of pharmaceuticals to treat that. The more research I did, I found out that it was a lot of things that I was missing in my diet, which I think is quite fascinating because many times we focus so much on what we shouldn't be having versus what we should be. By uh, supplementing and creating the nutrients that I needed, I was able to get off of those medications and live a much more fulfilling life. I think I was always meant to do this work. Really doing medicine, I realized that prevention was where it was at and doing nutrition and obesity management is preventive of really all the medical conditions that we deal with. We believe in making a change. You can go on and on about people that have made a change. Guarantee it wasn't easy for them. It was really hard and it was a sacrifice. What we said when we opened the restaurant was, you know, let's just, throw the stone in and make a ripple in the pond because we don't know what our customers are going out now and demanding. Saying, hey, I went to this Stella Luna, I went to Stella Luna and they offered you know, no seed oils. I'd, I'd never even heard about the seed oil thing. And then they talk to their neighbor, they're going on walks with their neighbor. Did you know seed oils were bad? Did you know they're in everything? And now everybody is turning the label. If you choose to take something off the table and not eat it, good for you. Just shut, shut up about it. In the complicated world of diets, it's abundantly clear that there is no one-size-fits-all solution. There are so many different dietary approaches, each with its own merits and limitations. From the vibrant spectrum of plant-based diets to the precision of calorie counting and the discipline of fasting, one thing remains evident. What works for one person may not work for another. Our bodies are as unique as our fingerprints, and the keys to lasting health and wellness are equally diverse. And there's this idea I feel like with when someone goes on a diet of sorts and they label themselves as, well, I'm paleo, I'm keto, I'm, I do Mediterranean, whatever it is that they say, you know, there's this idea that if you deviate from that, 
you have failed. Or if you deviate from that, people, you've, you've told people that you're paleo and now they see you eating black beans. Oh my gosh. You know, and, and there's just so much judgment out there about people following this line of a specific dietary program. I, I consider myself a clean eater. I do follow a macro diets where I try to get my numbers exactly and I don't count carbs or I don't count calories anymore. I never put my clients on a diet, ever. I don't put, I, there's never a diet that has a name that I put my clients on unless they themselves are adamant that that's what they want to be on. We look at the individual person, we look at what do your what does your lab work look like? Are you deficient or insufficient? Are you not optimal in certain vitamins, or or what? You know, and we go, okay, what foods can we put in your diet? And if it's severe enough, it's like you can't eat your way out of this. Like we have to put you on a supplement and change your diet in this area at the same time. And so oftentimes too, we'll start with one meal at a time. We'll go, what is the meal that you struggle with the most? And it's different for everybody. There is not a consistent answer amongst any of my clients. And so if it's breakfast, we'll be like, okay, great. We're gonna work on just breakfast for a while and let's see how that goes. And then we gradually move on. So it's gradual change. Everybody wants to be healthier in some aspect. So it's good to be open-minded because maybe you should try the keto diet. Maybe that's right up your alley. Maybe the Mediterranean diet is something that you've never tried before, but you will actually love it and it's completely attainable. Maybe vegan is the way to go for you. Everybody's different. It's really worth it to try different things to figure out what will work for you. Yeah, there's a lot of, again, different ways that we can look at this. I believe that our mindset really supersedes everything else. I think it's really, if people are trying to eat healthier, really taking the time for themselves to figure out what works for them and what doesn't. I could tell you the very best diet plan, but if you are thinking negative thoughts or going about your life in a way that you're self-sabotaging yourself, which we all do, by the way, we all, uh, are guilty of this, then at the end of the day, nothing that I can say matters. And in terms of our food and our, you know, grocery buying, for example, really keep it simple. If you can think of things in broad strokes, like, again, more from the earth, less from the pantry, you've really done a great service to yourself. Eating more colors, thinking about eating all the colors of the rainbow, that's really profound because every color is a different vitamin, mineral, nutrient, or antioxidant. I love this idea of um, making it matter, right? So if you're sitting at a beautiful Thanksgiving feast, overindulging perhaps with your family, yes, it's overindulging, but in some way that matters. That sense of community and togetherness matters while you're eating the, you know, potatoes and gravy or pumpkin pie. But those stale, you know, chips that you're eating while you're sitting in front of the TV, not even cluing in, not even mindful of what you're consuming, we can all agree that that doesn't matter, right? So if we can just go from there, like really being intentional about what matters, for me, I'm mostly a clean eater, but I still like to eat. I still love pizza. I still love candy. I'm, I love, I have a sweet tooth, but I do everything that I can in moderation. And that's why I recommend to everybody. The, the diet that worked for me was meat, some veggies, fruit, starches. I don't think that there's any one diet that's right for the masses. I think it really comes down to your body genetically. Looking at a standpoint of health, the way I see fueling your body healthy is, is keeping your metabolism highly functioning. That is all the chemical reactions going on in your body. You want them to be functioning at an optimal level. Whatever that looks like in terms of healthy eating, that's where you really want to do is keep your body functioning. When I think about metabolism, I think about all the food and drink that you consume is converted to energy. If it has not been converted to energy and it is storing in your body as fat, then that is not a healthy way of eating. When you look, you wanna look at things in the context of, am I eating whole foods and, and making good choices the majority of the time and then not feeling guilty because you had a piece of cake at a birthday party or a slice of pizza 
at someone's post-game celebration because they won the championship. Whatever. Like, just eat good food most of the time and enjoy yourself on occasion. And then finally, a mindset of abundance and not scarcity. When we talk about food, we're always talking about what you can't do, what you can't eat. I like to talk about what you can do, right? Eat nutritious foods in abundance. Eat so much of what serves you and what's good for you so that you have less room for what doesn't serve you. Abundance in terms of sleep. There's so many benefits the more sleep you get in terms of cognitive health, your mood, metabolic health. Uh, abundance in terms of nature. There are so many benefits of moving your body outdoors and outside. So let's not focus on what we shouldn't or can't do and slapping ourselves on the hand and move more towards what we can do. And that mindset of abundance is so much more powerful and actionable than the one of scarcity. It's crucial to remember that the best diet is the one that aligns with your individual needs, preferences, and lifestyle. Rather than seeking a universal answer, let's embrace the idea that success here lies in finding a balanced and sustainable approach that nourishes both body and soul. We're not happy on diets. We're, we're really not because there is a pleasurable side to food and we live in this modern world and there is a place where we can have both, but within reason, without judging ourselves and without judging other people and without feeling like we have to toe this line and label ourselves something. Just eat food, real food, most of the time. Okay, well, we can always do this again sometimes. Yeah, exactly.